This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to a very, very rainy Africa, or at least a rainy East Africa. And welcome to our sunset safari where we are huddled underneath the rain covers of our vehicle. And a very special welcome to the students joining us from South River Elementary. I hope you're all super, super excited to go out on safari. My name is Janie and I, what I'm showing you is live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. So up in the eastern side of Africa, right in the middle, essentially. In fact, the equator runs right through Kenya. And we're looking at some elephants through the window of our canvas rain cover because it is absolutely pouring here. Now, for our regular viewers, we will be taking questions initially from the students from South River Elementary. However, keep sending your questions through in the normal ways. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or comments on YouTube, and we'll get back to them afterwards. However, this is one of my favorite things to do, is take kids on safari. So for the students, this is a perfect opportunity for you to ask all the questions that you've wanted to ask about the animals. So we're sitting with what is known as a breeding herd of elephants, and you'll notice that they're just standing out in the rain, and there's nothing they can do about that. And in fact, they will completely ignore the rain so that they can continue to eat. Joey, you want to know what an elephant's favorite food is. Now, Joey, elephants really, really like fruit, particularly strong smelling fruit, something like an orange or a pineapple. They'd be known to even break into people's cars if they've learned that they can get a fruit out of them. So fruit, something with lots of sugar, is an elephant's favorite food but mostly when they're out in the wilds here they might eat some berries but mostly they're eating grass here in the Maasai Mara and they quite like grass and one thing that you'll notice is that there's lots and lots of grass here and that it's pouring with rain in the Maasai Mara but you're not just going to be seeing animals here you're going to be traveling to South Africa as well and in South Africa they are just going into the driest part of the year so the elephants there actually don't have much grass to eat and they have to eat the bark and the twigs and sticks of trees which isn't very nice for them I don't think personally but they don't seem to mind too much but for these elephants here in Kenya there's lots of what's known as red oat grass to keep them well fed so this is a breeding herd with lots of females and youngsters now a breeding herd is led by the most experienced female known as the matriarch she's usually the oldest but not necessarily and she tells the herd where to go but she doesn't have to do it on her own because she will have sisters and perhaps cousins who are around about the same age as she is usually around 40 to 50 years old which this elephant here could well be in fact I think she might be one of the oldest in this herd and you can see she has a tiny tiny little one at her side sheltering just a bit from the afternoon rain. Now you've seen Africa's biggest land mammal. Now across you go to South Africa to see Africa's tallest. Let me move, let me move. You're right. Hello everybody. Welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari. We're of course sitting in South Africa, if you can believe it, which is great fun. And those are two giraffe and they don't like each other very much. They're two bull giraffe and they are having a fight with each other. Isn't that wonderful? This is one of the most interesting things you can see out here. And you can see they'll push each other out the way and then they'll try and hit each other in the head. My name is James. It's lovely to have you with us and you can ask me any questions that you'd like to. We're going to sit with these giraffe for a little while and then we'll move on and maybe we'll try and find a leopard. So let's go back to those giraffe. I 
I hope that Virginia is a good place to be this morning. I imagine that things are probably starting to get a little bit colder there now as your uh, summer comes to the end. Well, Olivia, I'm not sure that I can tell you all the things about giraffe, but I can tell you some things about giraffe. And the things that I should tell you about here are the fact that the, what we're seeing is what's known as a dominance display. Now, a dominance display is where two animals try and decide who is the most senior, which one is going to be senior over the other one. And normally, these sorts of things are decided without violence and without fighting, but when two males are very evenly matched, in other words, when one is not obviously bigger than the other one, then what happens is they start to fight like this. The other thing to know about these giraffe, whoops, is that the males normally live on their own, and it's often that if they are together like this, that you'll see them fighting. Let me move a little bit forward. Oh, no, no, let's wait. Let's see if they don't come out from behind there. Let's go a little bit forward. We might get a nice view there. There we go. And you can see they're almost exactly the same size. So that it's not easy for them to, to decide who is going to be dominant, who's going to be more senior than the other one, who's going to be the boss, basically. They also kick quite badly. And so that's probably why you'll see them backing into each other. Because if they get too far from each other, or just the right distance away from each other, well, then they can inflict nasty pain with a kick. They kick with both front feet and back feet. And while it looks a little bit slow, you can be sure that when they do swing those heads, their pain that they inflict on each other is severe. Felder, in this part of South Africa, it's probably about 23 degrees Celsius or so, which is round about, I'm going to guess, at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it's pleasant, but it's not hot yet at the moment. And in the Masai Mara, I guess it's probably about the same. In other parts of South Africa, though, of course, it's different temperatures. Just like not everywhere in the United States is the same temperature as it is in Virginia, well, so it isn't the same temperature everywhere in South Africa. Whoa, that was a big one. Where my parents live, on the eastern Cape Coast of South Africa, it's probably a little bit cooler than it is here. In Cape Town, uh, which is the far southern part of South Africa, it's probably even cooler still. Remember that we're coming out of our winter now, as you come out of your summer, so we're coming out of our winter. Oof, this is quite vicious. Marcy, yes, the giraffe have names. The one on the left is called Thomas, the one on the right is called Gerald. That's not true. I'm joking. Just hold on one second, everybody. They don't have names, Marcy. I've just got to get onto the radio one second. Go ahead, Rex. I am live. Okay, copy. Confirm. Shortcut, Gallagher. Okay, copy. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. We've got a very nice surprise coming, thanks to Rexon, who's just told us that he has managed to spot something very special. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to suggest that we leave these giraffe now and go off towards this other surprise, which will be very nice indeed. It will take us about three minutes to get there. And so while we do that, let's go across to my friend Sydney, who's not too far from here. I think he's approaching a very big water hole.
A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the game drive. My name is Sydney and I am not alone this afternoon. I am with Feg. We are here by Chito Dem area trying to see if you can find some of the interesting cats for you. I am looking for Kuchava, one of the leopards in the area. As this morning, Kuchava was spotted having some morning meal. He's very much quiet here where I am. I'm looking up by these trees to see where Kuchawa is hiding the carcass. And it seems like the carcass is finished or else maybe we are not at the right place. But I'm going to hang around here and see if we can find something. So let's just uh, drive around here and see. Maybe we're gonna pick up some of the evidence. So I have not yet picked up any of the tracks here in the area. So what I'm seeing is quite a lot of tracks of uh, some of the impalas and some of the nyalas has been here before me. And another line we do have wartoks and earlier on as I was entering the area I did see two wartoks just very relaxed by the termite mound. If I see them again I am going to show you Pumba. They are very beautiful animals the uh, wartoks. So with their beautiful teeth coming out like elephant tusk. So they confuse a lot of people, they think they are baby elephants from a distance. So now let's go to uh, Jamie, she has got the baby elephant in Mara at the moment. So the baby. We are still with our elephants because I absolutely love spending time with elephants. In fact, if I had to spend all of my time with only one animal, I'd have to choose between elephants and hyenas because hyenas are also fascinating. But we're here with elephants now, and fortunately I don't have to choose, and we're just sitting watching them. And the reason that I love spending time with elephants is because they're always doing something interesting. There's always something to see, there's always something that they're up to, and they of course show such care to each other as a part of the herd. Now this elephant over here I think is a young male. Now he is probably around about I would say five, maybe six years old and he is right now sort of at the elephant equivalent of about your age actually for in elephant terms so he is not quite a teenager but is starting to get there and he's spending a little bit more time on, not away from his family but just exploring the world around him and sometimes getting caught up and forgetting where the rest of the family is Oh, there we go. There's another tiny little baby. This herd's actually got two little babies. Oh, this one is much younger. In elephant terms, this one is uh, its only about a year old. So in human terms, you could think of it as around about, mm, perhaps similar to a four-year-old child. And right now, except that it's still suckling, right now, <laughs> right now it wants to suckle and mom keeps hitting it in the head because she's digging. That's not very nice, Mum. <laughs> now, Lily Grace, in terms of how old an elephant it can get, well, elephants can live almost as long as human beings. 
So an elephant that is male, so a bull elephant, that's what we call a male elephant, like a bull cow. A bull elephant can live up to around about 50, maybe even 60 if he gets to a very old age. And a female elephant can even live over 70 years old, so up to about 75. And what's interesting about older elephants is they do sh start to show the signs of old age, but the reason that they really start to struggle and that they can't live too much longer than that <clears throat> is because they only get six sets of teeth. Now that might sound silly because as human beings we, are, we only have one permanent set of adult teeth that we start to get or that start to descend when we are between around about five and then your wisdom teeth coming last of all but you don't eat all day an elephant eats almost all day and what that means is that their molars their chewing teeth actually get worn down which is why they have six sets of teeth so one will get worn down and there'll be new teeth to come in and replace it and then that set gets worn down and so on but then by the time they reach their old, old age, there are no more teeth to replace the ones that they're wearing down. So they really start to struggle to chew. You can imagine, they, the teeth are now flat and an elephant has to eat all day because it has to maintain its massive size. Uh, even that slightly smaller elephant will weigh more than myself and this vehicle combined. So they really have to eat all the time. Oh, there's some zebra, sorry. Let's have a look at those quickly. Something else to show you in the rain because we can't really drive all that far from where we are now. There's some zebra walking in the rain. Now well, they are part of the great migration that has made its way from Tanzania to Kenya. And what that means is that nearly two million animals walk all the way, oh the elephant doesn't want any attention on the zebra, it wants to be the center of attention. They walk all the way from Tanzania to Kenya and they do that because of food. So they follow where the best food is, zebras and wildebeest mostly. So when we talk about the great migration, that's what we mean. Sometimes some topi get caught up as well. I don't know if those of you who are sharp eyed, maybe you can see those antelope at the back. I know it's a little bit drizzly, so you can't really see all that well. But the rain also means that we can't really move, although at least it's stopped. It's not as bad as it was. But it looks like it's going to keep coming. Now watch the way that the elephants use their trunks. So a trunk is very different to your arm or your leg. But an elephant has to use it just in the same way that you would have had to learn to use your arms to, to throw things or to catch or to write. So that trunk doesn't have any bones in it. It is a pure muscle. Now you can imagine if, if our arms, if you hold your arm out in front of you, wait, I'll show you what I mean. So hold your arm out in front of you and there's only certain ways that you can move it. You can kind of move it like this and maybe if you're you can twist at your shoulder because your shoulder is a socket joint, so you can move like this. You can move it up and down like this, but there's only so many ways that you can move, and you can't make it go against the bone. But an elephant has a full range of motion. It can twist, turn, pull the trunk up, put it down, bend it backwards, bend it forwards, do all sorts of things that we can't do with our arms. And that's interesting because an elephant's trunk is essentially like a human's arm. That's what they use it for. So watch the way that they reach down and pluck up the grass and move it to their mouths. Now if they didn't have that trunk, how would they eat? How do you suppose they would eat? They would have to bend all the way down and bite the grass off. And that would be very complicated and not very efficient. But the trunk does more than that. The trunk tells you about the elephant's mood. It tells you, or it, they use it to drink. They use it to communicate to each other, to gently touch each other, to smell, because it is essentially their nose. It's like a combination of a nose and a hand. Imagine if you had a nose on the end of your hand, how weird that would be. But that's essentially what an elephant has. Now that trunk is so strong it can reach up and break a branch, 
but they can also pick up a toothpick. Ah, there you go, Kato. You wondering about how much weight an elephant can pick up with their trunk. Now, I don't know if anybody's tested this, and this is a very interesting question, because we know that they're powerful enough, especially a big... Oh, <laughs> Mom, I want that. Mom, I want that. <laughs> I think all parents can relate to that, what just happened. Mom's trying to eat, and the baby wants it. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever tested exactly how much an elephant can pick up with its trunk, but I bet you that it could, with just that trunk, with the muscles alone, I bet you it could pick up over a 100 pounds if it had to. But they can also reach upwards and pull down to break branches. They can use their trunks to move things. Oh, there we go. That's better, little one. Can't steal the food out of your mom's mouth. Oh, no? Don't want milk now. So this little elephant is already eating solid food, but also drinking mom's milk. And sometimes they can't decide exactly what it is they want. You were so playful earlier, little Ellie. It really was. It was running around, chasing its friend. Elephant babies have a really nice life. They almost always grow up to adulthood because they're protected by the herd. Not always, sometimes they don't make it, but mostly they do. And they grow up in one big happy family with older cousins to look after them or aunts or even great aunts and grandmothers to take care of them and sisters, older sisters. So little elephant calves are really well looked after. And if they want to go and play and learn and explore, there's always a somebody keeping an eye on them. And because this one's drinking milk, it doesn't have to eat as often as mum does. Oh, there are very few things out here in the Maasai Mara that are dangerous to a baby elephant, but there are some things, and Sydney has got one of those predators with him right now. Look at that beautiful crocodile there, resting, just basking in the sun. This is what the reptiles do as the reptiles, they have to rely on the energy from the sun during the daytime. So that is why if you can check, a lot of reptiles during the winter season, they've got to hide because their body functioning during the winter season, they have to hide so that they can conserve food. So it is a process which is called hibernation. Hibernation is whereby uh, these reptiles go and hide until the dry season is finished and then come out. So look at this beautiful crocodile with the teeth show there. Look, it's moving now. But if you don't look very nicely, you might even think this crocodile is dead. He's very much relaxed at the moment. I can see that even the eyes are closed. It's very rare to see the crocodile with the eyes closed because they are very much observant. It's one of those animals which can be able to sleep with one eye open and one closed. So crocodiles can be very much dangerous when it comes to the babies of big animals such as the elephants. When they come to drink, they are got to be very much so now let's go to James. James, he does have um, one of the cats. I'm not too sure if it's a leopard, but I know he's got one of the dangerous animals. Well, what we have here is a very special animal. I'm not sure how dangerous it is, but it's a very special animal called a leopard. I don't know if any of you have been on safari with us before. But this is one of the things that we like to find the most over here, and it is called a leopard. And this particular leopard is a two and a half year old male leopard, and his name is Hosanna, which means the little chief. And he's called the little chief because his mother was known as the queen. Now that's not the best view of little Hosanna you'll ever get. We will try and move so that we can get a slightly better view of him. 
in a little while, but I'll tell you that there's also a hyena somewhere around here. I can't see the hyena at the moment. And there's also a kill in the tree above us, which we can't see right now. Okay. Mm. No. Uh, and he's managed to kill himself a little dica, which is a very small animal, and unfortunately it's a baby one as well. We don't need to look at that. It's in the tree. He's put it in the tree so that the hyena can't get it. So there's the leopard. We'll look at him for a little while. And we'll see if we can't get a slightly better view shortly. Blake, a leopard is very fast. It can probably run at about 70 kilometers an hour, 70 to 75 kilometers an hour, which is around about 45 to 50 miles an hour. So call it 50 miles an hour. They're very fast. No, 50 miles an hour is probably slightly fast. Let's say 47 miles per hour, 40 to 45 to 47 miles per hour. But that's not for a long time. They can only do that for a short time for a short distance, and then they have to stop. Otherwise they get very hot. And their muscles get very tired. But their big ability is to be able to get from zero to 47 miles per hour in two strides. So whereas you and I would take a lot longer to get from zero to top speed, they can do it in a very short time indeed. Right, I think we should move. Let's see if we can get a better view of him. We'll move down through this little gully here and see if we can't get a better view of our favorite leopard. Well, Olivia, I'll show you what they eat. This is not going to be nice. I know some of you might be quite sad by this. Is that all right? Can you see him there? That's a baby diker, and that's a bit sad. But that's what they eat. Remember, everyone has to eat out here, and so that's what they eat, a baby diker. So that's one of the antelope species, and then they will eat fish and frogs and sometimes even termites. They'll eat terrapins, which are like freshwater turtles, and that sort of thing. They are what we are known, or what is known as generalists, which means that they will eat just about anything that they can catch. Now, I hope we don't get stuck here because we don't want to be stuck next to a leopard, do we? Can you imagine being stuck next to a leopard? It would be terrifying. I would be terrified. No, I wouldn't really. We know this very special cat. We know him very well, and we know that he is used to us, and so as long as we don't behave like idiots, and as long as we behave in a manner that is responsible, so we stay in the vehicle, we don't make a big noise, he will be very comfortable around us and he won't attack us, and he won't run away. There's a lovely view of him. Isn't that nice? Look at that. Now this is a very special thing to see. Now although we're very close to this leopard, remember, he is a wild animal. And he's just used to the vehicles. Which means that he doesn't see us as something to be afraid of, and at the same time, he doesn't see us as something to eat. So he just sort of sees us as something that comes in and goes away, and he's been around vehicles since the day he was born. Isn't he lovely? He's one of our very favorite cats, this chap. Hello William. We don't really know how many animals we have. Interestingly, right at this time of the year, they're doing a count of all the animals, and we'll get those results hopefully at some stage. But the park is very big. This particular park that we're in, we have an area to move around in of round about, I'm going to say, 8,000 acres or so, which sounds quite big but it really isn't that big. But we're part of a much bigger area known as the Kruger National Park, which is in turn part of a much bigger area known as the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Now, the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park covers two international boundaries. So it goes into Zimbabwe and it goes into Mozambique, and it is 3.5 million hectares in extent, 
which is about 8 million acres. Now, as far as I'm aware, that's much bigger than Yellowstone National Park even. So it is a very, very large piece of ground. And to count all the animals in there is almost impossible. But we can tell you that there are probably round about 15,000 elephants. There are probably round about 100,000 buffalo. There are probably round about 300 to 500,000 impala, which are the most common antelope we get here. I would say about 3,000 lions, perhaps. No one really knows for sure. I don't know how many leopards there are. Probably about the same, actually, about 3,000 leopards. About 350 wild dogs. So wild dogs are really the ones that are very endangered. And then, of course, nobody knows how many diker there are. The diker is what's sitting in the tree over there. That's what Horsana killed. Nobody knows how many stienbok or dung beetles or how many uh, bats. So it's difficult to count the animals, but they do try, and then they get an idea of how many there are. And as long as they compare, the, if, as long as they use the same method every single year, then they will be able to compare whether or not the animals are getting more or less. Let's go back across to Sydney with a much more ancient predator. The crocodiles we are seeing now is not the one that we saw just earlier. This is another one staying at the very same waterhole. Look at that. This is very much big. It's way much bigger than the one that we saw earlier on. These crocodiles can grow up to four to five meters. That is very much huge. And if you look at those teeth that are coming out from the mouth, crocodiles can grow the teeth for the whole life cycle. So if they want some of the teeth, they're going to grow back until they die. These kind of animals can survive. They can live up to 150 to 200 years. It's one of those animals that has got the longevity of life. Now the lions, the crocodiles are carnivores. The carnivores are the animals that feed on meat. In other words, a crocodile is one of the predators. If any other animal comes here, such as the impala or the steenbok, even nyalas, sometimes animals such as wildebeest together with the zebras get caught by the uh, crocodiles. Mostly they target the youngsters, the young ones. These animals are very much powerful. They can, they can be able to take down a very big animal. So, but when it's resting, relaxed like that, uh, you will never take them dangerous. If you find him chasing an animal, you will see that it can be dangerous because they can ambush very easily. How he is lying down now, if anything comes there, you will see how he's going to get down in order to catch that animal. They can be very fast, especially when they are in water. Listen to that. Logan, the crocodiles can spend much of the time out of the water for many, many hours. They can go down in water just to try and cool down a little bit. But most of their time is spent outside the water. They sleep there in water, but for the sun, they must have to be out. So they can be able to lie down here for long hours. Not to show how many hours exactly, but I know they do spend much of their time outside basking the, the sun. I didn't copy that. FC, if you can repeat the question.
So the animals which were making a very interesting sound earlier on is the animals that are sharing the very same place with the crocodiles. Look at that. Those are the hippopotamus. So hippopotamus and the crocodiles can stay together because they don't have any competition when it comes to what they eat. The hippopotamus, they are herbivores, meaning that they feed on vegetation. Whereas the crocodiles, as I have indicated earlier, they are carnivores. Yes, there are times whereby crocodiles do try to catch the baby hippopotamus, but hippos are also well equipped in order to defend their babies. They've got very big tooth. Maybe one of them is gonna open the mouth now and try to show us how the tooth looks like. Look at that. If you look at the pink outer layer of the eyes, it tells you that this is a female hippopotamus. Look at that. Those ones are playing. So the males, the outer layer of the eyes is very much dark. So the female is pink. So it means what we are seeing now, that one is a female. And it looks like that female has got a baby standing next to it. So you can see that the eyes are located high on top of the head and the nostrils as well, they are located on top so that these animals, when the whole big body is submerged, they can be able to, to breathe and also to see what's happening in the surrounding. They are not very good swimmers, the hippopotamus. Sachala, I'm not too sure when it comes to the amount of water the hippopotamus are drinking every day. But here, they are staying very close to the water source. But uh, hippopotamus are one of those animals which does not lose a lot of water, as the water helps them when it comes to things such as dehydration. Although I know the skin of the hippopotamus is very much highly sensitive to the sun. So when they're in water, the, the dehydration doesn't take place too much. There's quite a lot of water conservation. Here comes the baby. You can see now that uh, the baby is there. So now uh, let's go to uh, Masai Mara where Jamie has got some elephants and see how the elephants are doing this afternoon. I will be here still looking for this hippo. Now, elephants are also big drinkers. In other words, they like to drink lots of water. And <clears throat> the reason that they do that is because their digestive system uses up a lot of water to break down and get the nutrients out of all of the plants that they eat. So on a very hot day, and I have to say that this is not a very hot day in the Masai Mara, it's a very cold day in the Masai Mara, but on a hot day, an elephant can drink up to around about 50 gallons of water. So to give you a rough idea, if you had a bath this evening, a bath, not a shower, but a bath, that whole bathtub is how much an elephant could drink in one day. A big fool fully grown elephant of course obviously the little ones don't need to drink quite as much as the adults because they don't eat as much solid food and they still drink milk not for this gentleman though this young male is long past the stage of drinking milk but he'll still stay close to his mother and it's only when he's around about 15 or so years old depending that he will actually leave the safety of the herd and begin his life as a bachelor. In other words, living alone or with other male elephants. Here we go, twisting the plants and gobbling them down. Now what you would have noticed is that the elephants haven't stopped eating since we got here. And I was hoping that some of them might decide to play because when it's nice and cool like this, elephants actually love this weather. And that's because they're very, uh, this is going to sound very silly. They're very big animals, just in case you hadn't noticed. I'm only kidding. They're big animals, which means that their surface area to volume ratio is very, very low. So that means basically that they get quite hot 
and it's hard for them to lose that heat. And the way that they lose the heat, they don't sweat like human beings sweat. When You know when you get really hot, if it's a very, very hot day, and I know that there's been some hot summers in the northern hemisphere, then you will start to sweat. But what elephants do is they flap their ears. And that's because it helps to cool down the blood that is close to the surface of their ears. So if you look at them now, it's nice and cool. So they're not really flapping their ears because they're not too hot at all. They're probably a very pleasant temperature. But when it gets hot, then the blood vessels in the ears start opening up even more so that lots of blood flows in there. And that's why their ears have got this big surface area. And you'll notice that they seem quite thin compared to the rest of the elephant. And so that's as, that the blood can get as much air flowing over it as possible, or flowing over the skin, which cools down the blood, which then goes to the rest of the elephant and helps to keep them cool. And since we are looking up nice and close, you will even have noticed the eyelashes on this beautiful young elephant. Look at their eyes. Beautiful, gentle eyes. But Connor, no, that does not mean that we can pet them. We cannot pet any of the animals that we see out here. They are all completely wild, and if we tried, we would frighten them, and they would react in one of two ways. Most likely, they would try and run away, but they might even attack us, because that would be horribly disrespectful for them. They don't understand that, that you might mean well, that you don't want to hurt them. They see us as a threat, and they would be very, very unhappy. Now, there's a big thing happening in the world at the moment of people petting wild animals. It's a bad thing. Wild animals must be wild. We have dogs, we have cats, we have horses. They rely on us. We've domesticated them over many, many years. That's okay. We can have pets. But to have wild animals as pets, <clears throat> or to treat them as pets, is very sad and very dangerous because they don't understand and their instincts tell them that they are wild. So if you ever get the opportunity to perhaps play with a pet cat, or pick big cat I mean, like a lion or a tiger, or maybe even a monkey, that's something that you should say no to because it's very, very unfair on that animal. These wild animals are quite happy without people. They don't mind having us here in the car, in the vehicle, they're used to us. They're completely relaxed as long as we don't invade their space. Speaking of perfectly relaxed big cats, let's go and see what Hosanna thinks of all of that. Hosanna doesn't think much right now. He's uh, dreaming because he's a perfectly, perfectly comfortable cat. And you can see that from the fact that his belly is so full. His belly is so full because obviously he hasn't only just started eating that little diker. He's been eating something for probably the last three or four days. Now we do know that he, uh, not yesterday, in fact it was yesterday morning, he finished off an impala that he stole from his sister Tundi. She in turn stole it from some wild dogs, so don't feel sorry for his sister Tundi. There you see, he's feeling a little bit guilty. He's lifted his head up as if to say, I'm sorry I did that. But he's eaten that, and then I think he probably ate something else yesterday as well, because you can see he's got a very, very fat belly. And so for a leopard like this to be full and fat in the shade like this where he can snooze is just perfect. Logan, I'm afraid I couldn't possibly count the number of leopards I've seen. I don't know. I'm sure it's well over a hundred, but I'm not sure. You know, I've been out in this area for about, let's call it 15 years now, and so I've seen a lot of leopards. Just not counted them, I'm afraid. Maybe about a hundred. If you work in the same area, then you will learn, or you'll get to know all the leopards of the area, and then you'll just see the same ones again and again. But if you move around a bit, well, then you can see lots of different leopards. 
And for me, and I think for all of us, and probably for all of the people who watch this show, it's not so much the number of leopards that you see, it's much more about how you get to know them and, and what they do and learning their different characteristics and their different personalities. Hosanna, for example, is an interesting leopard because he seems to like being around other leopards. That's probably because he's quite young and when he's a bit older, I suspect he will become more solitary. But it's still very interesting to see how different he is with other leopards compared with other young males that I've known before. And he's also quite comfortable with us on foot, or he certainly was as a little boy. No, he's not quite as comfortable. All right, everybody, uh, for those of you at school, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'm sorry that school has started and you're staring down the barrel of another full year of school, but don't worry, it will end in about 10 years' time. And yes, that will happen much faster than you think it will. I know it sounds like a long time, but it isn't. Hopefully, we'll see you very soon on safari again. Until then, bye-bye. Right, in the meantime, let us go back to Sydney, who apparently has got something called a slow monitor lizard. I'm not sure how what difference that is from a fast one. I have got one of the very beautiful reptiles there. You can see that is the water monitor. I know a lot of people, they do have a confusion between the water monitor and the rock monitors. But looking at the size, this is way much smaller than the uh, rock monitor. So the water monitor has got a very big body size. The, the design and the shape of the body is the same. And the color as well is more or less the same. So this monitor, now you can see the tongue is in and out. That is when this monitor is trying to check and trying to investigate what is happening in the surrounding. That tongue is telling him now a lot of things about what is happening in the surrounding. Just from the air, just from smelling the tongue from the air, he's going to know what he's looking for. If he's looking for a partner, he's going to find where exactly that partner is. So you can see, now he's slowly approaching the crocodile. Look at that tail. He's now hiding away behind the crocodile. Shiny tail from the crocodile. This tail, it can go up to 7 to 7.5 feet. So somewhere here by the tail is where the crocodile is uh, mostly storing the food in order to survive during the harsh conditions. These animals have got an ability uh, to reduce the functioning of the body systems so that they can conserve a lot of food. What's happening now when the mouth is open, it means that this crocodile is, gener is getting quite a lot of uh, high temperature from the sun. So now to get rid of too much temperature, high temperature from the body, they've got to open the mouth and the mouth helps them in order to balance the body temperature. So now you can easily see the teeth showing uh, when he's opening the mouth somewhere right on the layers of the mouth the crocodile has got something which is called the doomed pressure receptors when the crocodile is in the water if you touch the water somewhere here by the layers of the mouth they can be able to pick up the updates and know that something is entering the water hole so they use this doomed re pressure receptor in order to detect what is happening so it's a very much adaptable species. So if you look at these crocodiles and the trees that are growing next to it, they all look the same. And Tian, I didn't copy that uh, question very well, if you can repeat that. The teeth of the monitor lizard, that is quite a tough one. I have never seen the teeth of this monitor lizard. I'm not too sure uh, what kind of teeth they've got, but what I know is that the lizards, after a bite, 
you get negatively affected because they carry quite a lot of bacteria here on their mouth parts. So they, the one about the teeth, I've got to investigate a lot after this activity to see how the teeth looks like. Because every time I just see them with the tongues in and out. Oh no, the lizards, they do carry some of the poisons uh, as I indicated that when they bite, they carry quite a lot of bacteria on the mouth. So if you got bitten by this kind of species, you must have to consult because otherwise you might be amputated because those bacteria might give you the diseases. Diseases which can be transmitted from these animals to us. So you're gonna have to be very much careful when handling this kind of reptiles. So, but big reptiles such as crocodiles, they are no-go area because these ones are very much dangerous and they don't want anything to come near them. Not because of the level of aggression, but because they prey on meat. So these animals, they don't have a tongue and the crocodile teeth looks very much clean. Why? Because the crocodiles, they have got a dependency with some of the species. One of the birds I have seen who is fond of a very best friend of the crocodile is the decop. A decop is one of the birds that we see at night. They are nocturnals. It's the ones that normally comes here and eat some of the meat that are stuck. Look at that. It's closing now on a very slow motion. Not closing completely, opening it again. So the de the decop is, is the one who normally comes there and eat the small piece of meat that is left. But when the crocodile is opening the mouth like this, some of the insects, such as the flies, they go in there, he's got a very sticky kind of a saliva which attach them. When they land, they don't fly. And some other flies in the area, when they see those flies stuck, they think they are feeding nicely and they think about greener pasture. They go in there for feeding and when it's too much is when it's going to close the mouth and eat them. Open again to attract and close and eat them. So he's very much adapted. This animal is very big but they can run very fast. Yeah, the crocodiles do hunt on land. Let me tell you the story. I come from the very deep rural areas where sometimes when there is no water by the taps, we've got to go to the rivers in order to uh, collect some water. Some of the crocodiles, they walk far as 20 kilometers away from the rivers. You find them in the middle of the villages hunting the domestic dogs. The crocodiles and dogs, they, they get along. The crocodiles, they prefer the dog meat a lot because of the smell the meat has got. The, the crocodiles can walk very long distances. And the story around the crocodiles, where I come from, you are not allowed to kill the crocodiles. If you come across the crocodiles out of the water in the village, you're gonna have to consult the senior authority, normally the tribal authority, to call the conservist to come and collect it. Why? Because we have got a very strong belief on crocodiles. We believe that the, the brain of the crocodile, it can turn and be converted into a poisonous substance, which can be very dangerous when ingested. So if there is any rumor that someone has killed a crocodile, we're going to have to arrest you for that purpose. It's not moving at all. So now, while I am still here by the Chitra Dam looking for any other interesting animals coming to drink, let's go back to Osana. James has got Hosanna. Maybe it's now a good sighting. He is not awake. He is fast asleep. You can see that he is, in fact, barely moving. One would suspect, in fact, uh, that he had had some sort of anesthetic, which, of course, he has. It's known as food out here. And if you listen very carefully, you might even be able to hear the sound 
of the air escaping his nostrils and blowing against a piece of grass. I shall now be quiet. Ah, oh, the fan on the vehicle's a bit loud. I'm not sure you can hear it. He's going... <laughs> And he hasn't actually moved a muscle since we last, or since you last were here. So I'm going to do uh, what some others do, and I seldom do, and that is, uh, well, we're going to have a poll, everybody. And the poll is going to be as follows. Should I stay or should I go? In other words, should we stay with this flat cat in the hopes that he climbs up the tree and swallows his baby diker? Or should we go and see what else we can find and come back here later? Hashtag Safari Live or the chat stream on YouTube. You can tell us what you'd like us to do and your wish shall become our command. There you can see in the tree there is a diker weighing roughly 300 grams. It really is a very small diker. I'm not sure why. I can think the, I think the only reason he hasn't devoured it straight away, well, there are probably two reasons. One is that there's a hyena not far away. And the other is that he's so full, he probably doesn't know what to do with it. Now, Tristan, when he came in here earlier today on foot with Herberto, they thought that they had heard some kind of distress call just as the drive ended, and that could easily have been this young diker uh, giving it sort of death wail, if you like. It's not a very nice way of putting it, but I think that's probably what it was. And so they will be both relieved and, uh, well, I suppose slightly upset that they didn't find him. They will be relieved that they were in the right vicinity, though. All right, let's go quickly across to the bird with Sydney, and I shall either see you here, uh, depending on the pole, or I shall be looking for something else. For the first time, I am seeing the African fish eagle landing right in water. I always see these kind of birds flying and catching, and not standing like he is now. Maybe he's going to show us some mud bath. So birds, they've got various ways of cleaning themselves. Look at that, he's walking. Maybe he's gonna do something. He's drinking. If you look at uh, the hook, the beak, he must have to catch water and look up so that he can drink. He cannot be able to swallow water when he's facing down. So this kind of birds, they've got a very interesting call. You will hear them and they can be able to call on flight right high up. So they can weigh up to three, uh, three and a half kilograms and they can survive very long. These birds can survive up to 40 years. Quite a very small animal surviving for 40 years. And most of these uh, eagles, they are monogamous, they are partners for life. So I was explaining that the uh, birds, they use quite a lot of uh, various ways in order to clean themselves. So they, yes, the um, fish eagles are lovely. Look at that beautiful coloration. So if the fish eagle doesn't want to use the water bath, He's got another option, uh, which is called dust bathing, where he must land on the ground and play in dust in order to get rid of the parasites. And if he is not interested on that, he must then go up by the tree, high up by the trees, open the wings in order to get rid of the parasites. And if he doesn't want that, he must land on the ground and look for the ants and go and let the ants to walk on them and then suddenly provoke the ants Ants are going to react by releasing the formic acid, and that formic acid is rich in fat and is going to serve as an antiparasitic. So the bears themselves, they know that they've got to do all these ways in order to clean themselves.
So I'm just hoping this fish eagle is going to show us some water bath this afternoon. Oh no, the fish eagle, the weight is 3.5 kilograms. So it's quite a very big bird, but it's not the biggest flying bird. The heaviest flying bird is the Cory Bastard. I haven't seen them here since I've arrived, but they are some of those species that are occurring here in Southern Africa. There is drinking again. So these birds can be able to see very well. Imagine a fish eagle seeing a fish underwater when it's high up and go straight to the target and be able to catch it without any miss. So that is telling you that the vision of these birds, they are very good. And if you look at the head, the head of the birds is only there in order to accommodate the eyes. It's not like ours. Ours, we have got big heads which are there in order to accommodate the size of the brain. So the bird has got small brain and big skull, and that skull is there to then create max space for the eyes. is concentrating to some other small birds which are making noise. It seems like the other small birds are very good friends with the fish eagles because most of the birds, when seeing the eagles, they vocalize and they mobilize and try to chase them. Here, the birds are very much comfortable because they know that he's not a threat. He is depending on these fishes. Some of these birds, when they come to do a water bath, they... So when, when these birds are on the ground like this, wanting to do the water bath, some of them, after a water bath, they come out with their feathers wet. And in order for them to dry the feathers, you will see them opening their wings in order to dry that. These birds, they are very well equipped with some of the preening gland. At the back, just by the beginning of the tail, they have got some very fatty cleaning gland. It's called a uropygial gland. They must have to take it out and put it on the feathers in order to maintain waterproof. Some of the birds don't have that cleaning gland. That is why when coming out of the water, they get wet. So you can see now he decided to go so now uh, let's go to uh, Mara with a very uh, nice voice of the hippopotamus saying goodbye to Chitwa Dam and see how the hyenas are doing. I'm with the hyenas, but there's something I have to tell you and it's not very pleasant at all. And we're not going to follow Waffles where she's going. And this is what we discovered here shortly before the start of drive, in fact probably about 15 minutes before the start of drive. One of the cubs is dead. Not only is one of the cubs dead, but it's been half eaten. I'm pretty sure that it's Waffles's, and I'm very sorry to have to tell you this, but I have to warn you that this is incredibly gruesome and incredibly difficult to watch. She's been picking it up and putting it back down in her den incredibly gently it is absolutely heartbreaking and for many of you I want to tell the story from the start to the finish and I don't want to surprise you with something that is probably one of the most terrific things I've seen out here especially being as invested as we is as we is as we are in the story in the past we've been accused briefly with the Nkuhumas of of overemphasizing tragic stories, particularly with that cub, and that's not why we do it. But what's playing out here is really fascinating. Now, we don't know what's happened to the cub. She's going to go and pick it up, and we're going to show you, but we're warning you now, this is not for sensitive, for sensitive viewers, and I will warn you if she's moving towards it, which she is now. Now, there's something playing out here with polar bear. Polar bear's been desperate to try and get in. Okay, she's going up to the cub. All right, we're going to show it 
For those of you that are sensitive, please don't look. You can turn away now because I think Waffles is going to eat it. She's been so gentle with it up until now. But it's the way of the wild and resources are resources. And polar bears just kicked her out of the entrance to the den. I don't believe what's happening here. I don't know what happened. I don't know which cubs are still alive. I don't know for certain that this is her cub. This is incredibly difficult for us to watch. Oh my girl, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We discovered this before the school drive. Obviously, we couldn't responsibly show it to the kids. But for kids that are watching now, they, of course, have your guidance in this. Who are you now? Another hyena that's come on the dead cub. But because we're desperate to know if there is another one alive in there. If I had to guess, I would say it was Waffles' cub, but I can't believe Polar's just kicked her out of the entrance to the den. She's been desperately coming back all day, and she's just moved the matriarch. And Waffles has been picking this cub up and putting it, uh, to call it a cub is, is not right, picking up the carcass and putting it back in the hole so gently, which makes me think it's hers. But now polar bears growling. I don't know what's going on. Calcix, I don't know. I have no idea if the other cub's okay. I where did polar bear just run to? What is that? Hold on. There's something else there. Oh, it's another hyena, it's sloth bear. Now Waffles is running back. So that's Polar Bear's little brother. I don't know who this other hyena is that's entered the scene. I'm gonna move into a better position. I started where the goriness was slightly hidden so that I could warn you. What is going on? If I had to guess, I would say it was hypothermia that killed this cub in the rains and the mud. This is such a terrible den. It's just one big mud slick. But now Polar Bear's gone in. Is her cub alive? Is Waffles' other cub alive? We just, we just don't know. And that's why I want to be here. As horrible and hard as it is, we're invested in this story for good and for bad. Polar Bear and Sloth Bear's mother was here earlier, Sour. And you know, the funny thing is, is that during the, the Gauntlet series, as we were leading up to it, we suggested that Sour would be the strongest contender to the throne if she ever planned a coup. And I, we decided to scrap that story because Sour never showed any aggressive inclination. But now, who and what killed Waffles' cub? And why didn't Waffles fight Polar Bear there? That's not a good sign. Yes. Taja, there's a strong possibility that while Waffles was away, if the cub died, that the other cubs ate it, the older cubs. Which is what Slo Sloth Bear's looking at doing now. There's another hyena coming in. Listen. That's, that's sour. It's Waffles making that growl. Sour is unbelievably hyped up. She went to go and sniff Waffles' dead cub. Waffles chased her away. But there was no sign of submission from Sour. She moved.
What's wrong, Polo? What's wrong? There was an alarm call, that velociraptor-like rumble. What on earth happened? Oh my girl, I'm sorry. This was a bad den. Hello, Sloth Bear. Hello, my boy. You smelly. Yes, you are. You're very smelly. Polar's going back to the den. Deadhead, Sloth Bear won't be taking over the clan. He's only six months old at the moment. And coups, when they tend to happen, tend to... Ooh, Sloth Bear. He's gone up to the carcass of the cub. Coups, when they happen, are very unusual, and they happen very quickly and very aggressively. Something snaps, from what I understand. I've never actually witnessed one. Something snaps in the animals that then rise up and overthrow the matriarch. But who knows? Did Polar Bear know that Waffles was restricting her access because she had cubs there too? Sorry about that everybody, I have no idea what happened in the Marsi Mara, but obviously uh, other than the exceptional hyena action, uh, <laughs> uh, something else happened possibly of a technical nature, no one's talking to me at the moment so I don't know, but we had a whole lot of Nyala and Kudu over here. There's a Kudu, in fact there are quite a few Kudu. And we also had some Impala, it was a very peaceful gentle scene here. Ah, I see that we had a technical issue in the Masai Mara, that's why you've come to me. That's good. Well, it's good in that it's not a train smash. Just a lovely peaceful scene of two browsing species, and in fact three, if you count the Impala, sitting in this riverbed, eating the last of bits of sort of greenish leaf and enjoying a few new ones. Now, those kudus... As far as I'm aware, excuse me, I, my binoculars was making friends with, with my radio, are eating, what are they eating? A lot of animals at the moment are favouring the buds on the Tambuti trees. And that chap is, that's exactly what he's doing. He's eating the little buds off the Tambuti tree, which are obviously extremely nu nutritious, but they do have that supposedly toxic milky latex in them. Some species, of course, are completely immune to it. We are not one of those species. Porcupines, black rhinos come to mind, and of course kudu do seem to be immune to quite a lot of nature's toxins, including the milky latex of our African cactus equivalent, which is known as the euphorbia. Let's just roll gently down the hill. Um, Emma, I hope the signal will be all right. It should be, because it's winter. In summer, I'm pretty sure it would be terrible. This is the worst. Oh, everything's okay. I was hoping we might get a look at the nice Nyala herd that popped across the road. Well, there's an Impala. He'll have to do. As I always say, you need to stop at an Impala at least once a day. There he is, sprinting away. He doesn't like any of you, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Or me. Or David. There we go. This is a good time of the year for the Impala. Because they don't have their youngsters yet, they're not attracting the attentions of all the predators. 
They're not fighting with each other, which again is not attracting the attentions of the predators. But we are about to hit September. And so that secondary breeding season, of which I speak quite regularly, is about to take place. It's the only time I've ever actually witnessed impala mating. And they seem to mate during the day, during the secondary breeding season. And that secondary breeding season will take place sometime during next month. That impala had some sort of, it uh, looked like a hernia on its belly there. There's a little nyala in front of us. Hello, little nyala. Now running away to join the other nyala. Is that right there, Dov? They boo some nyala cows and of course a very wise impala ram with a hernia hanging out with some other antelope that can keep an eye out for predators. These ones I think are eating old torchwood fruits. I don't think they're new, I think he's picking up some old ones. There must be some sort of nutrition to be gained from them. And the Nyala, until fairly recently, were coming to visit the tent, as I think I've told you perhaps before, quite regularly, because outside the tent we've got a whole lot of bones and things that we used when we were using the tent for broadcasting. And the Nyala have quite enjoyed the little collection of bones that we have there. They suck on bones a lot at this time of the year for the phosphorus and calcium that is lacking in the dry vegetation that they're trying to eat. Now we did leave Hosanna, which is pretty obvious, which we will try and go back to a little bit later. Once the sun starts to set. It is very dry here, everyone. That's perfectly normal for this time of the year. It's not even a particularly dry year. In fact, it's a, probably quite a wet one. And it's going to get drier. It's going to start looking browner as we go into September and October. Now, the leaves on the trees will start to flush, but the grass will not flush green until there has been a substantial amount of rain. Right, our plan now is to go off to Buffelsuk Dam, see what we can find over there. We might be lucky. Oh, let's quickly go across to Jamie. Something's happening there at the hyena den. Unfortunately, it is going to take 10 seconds for you to get there. <sighs> Waffles' cubs are alive. Both of them. It was polar bear's cub. Oh. I don't know how I feel about that. Horribly, horribly relieved, I think. And yet, how terribly unfair on Polar Bear. Because it must have been Waffles. Or it was hypothermia. We don't know. We'll never know. But look. Look. Look at our precious little bundles. No wonder Waffles was so anxious. No wonder she moved that carcass away. She didn't know what to do with it. Waffles is not known as a cub killer. She's a benign matriarch, but she didn't want that carcass in the den with her babies. Of course. And now when I see them, they look so much smaller, but it's so hard to make that judgment call. Polar's removed her cub, her dead cub. She's eaten it. I apologize for the attack of the gremlins. She's taken it away. She's consuming it now where we can't... I can't move the vehicle without losing track of Waffles' cubs. What an emotional roller coaster. Oh. What we have just witnessed is some of the most fascinating examples of hyena behavior in the world. Here's Sour marching around Waffles. I hate to say this, but it may also have been Waffles' refusal to move from the entrance to the den and Polar's choice 
to keep her cubs there that could have contributed to its death. And yet when I spoke to the researchers three days ago, Polar Bear was moving her cub backwards and forwards. She could have moved it. She could have moved it away. Why didn't she? Because hyenas are social and the clan is the clan. And for Polar Bear's cubs to have grown up with Waffles' cubs would have made them friends. Or at least allowed them to ingratiate themselves with it. Oh, Waffles. Here I was weeping for you, and it was poor Polar Bear. There's our little notch ear. <laughs> A mark we will always be able to recognize it by. Oh, look at them. Oh, they're so gorgeous. Lindsay, I'm so sorry. I wasn't listening to your question at all. I was still trying to hear my my thoughts over the drumming of my heart. Oh, Lindsay, 50%. 50% is the survival rate for hyena cubs in the wild. Less than, most likely, will make it past their first year. So, while we have this moment of, I guess, relief, mixed in with, with heartache, We could still face the scenario again. They've grown so much. They've got so big. Hello. <laughs> and the momentous nature of this revelation is eclipsed slightly by the sound of the elephants passing gas next to us. <laughs> what a strange afternoon. <sighs> Hello, little sloth bear. And they look dry, don't they? Not dry enough. Hello, Mommy. I'm going to go exploring. That one's always been the bolder one, hasn't it? The smooth ears. The little notched ears, not quite as brave as its sibling. Oh, Mom's going to fetch it. Where do you think you're going? Where do you think you're going? Well, Mom. I think I would like to be in a hole that didn't, up until recently, have a deceased cub. Oh, okay. Right, after that emotional roller coaster, I have no idea how I feel. Let's go and see another small creature of Africa. Look at that. This is quite a lovely sighting. I have got the dwarf mangoes right basking in the sun. They are enjoying a sighting of me and Ferg. They are looking at us. They have been looking at us for a while now. These kind of social animals can be very much interesting. What I like the most about the dwarf mangoes is that the hierarchical structure is most interesting than all the animals. Yes, they are matriarchal structure whereby is led by the female uh, together with her mate. The mate, the male is the one following the highest rank of the female. But after that, everything is going to be in reverse. The young ones, then when they are born, they fight for the dominance. So they are born with the instinct desire of the dominance in order to gain the position and also in order to get prioritized when it comes to food. So that is very much interesting because these animals knows that if the, the newborns are ranked very low, chances of them to eat is not there. But if the newborns becomes high in terms of ranking, then chances for them to eat is very high. These kind of animals, they eat a variety of food, including reptiles. I've seen them a lot fighting animals such as snakes, and they're not afraid at all. They can be very much aggressive. And they also eat insects such as the flying ants. They also do eat termites. I don't know how these animals handle termites because the soldier termites can bite. Maybe in these kind of termite mounds where they are staying, 
they are also attracted by the diet, not only uh, because of the effect that the termites gives them a good temperature in there. very much observant so they're using that top part as an observation post and they can be very much gregarious there must be quite a lot of dwarf mangoes in there it's quite a very big termite mound look at that so these animals after a period of pregnancy of about 100 days they can litter uh, up to three to four little ones and only the matriarchal female is allowed to breed if by accident the male mate with one of the daughters or any other female, the chances of the babies to be killed by the matriarch are very much high. So the matriarch doesn't allow any other mating, form of mating apart from her. That is part of her responsibilities. She's the only one who does mating. They are very much observant and very much fast. So while I'm still here in Chitwa area trying to get hold of uh, Kuchava, let's go back to Mara and see the hyenas. Maybe there's some other interesting things going on there at the moment. Jenny is waiting. And see what happens next. Oh, to be honest, I don't think I can take any more shocks. I really don't. Paula came back briefly around the den, and now she's moved off. Her mother came back as well. The only thing... Oh, there's Paula. She's here. Oh, shame. She was in the hole. I'm sorry, girl. You know, I did respond with relief to see Waffles as cubs alive. And that's very human of me, I guess. I know Waffles better than I know Polar Bear. I also know that Waffles is very, very old. And this is most likely going to be her last litter. And it's her f bloodline's hope for the future. Plus she has a unique personality of her own. Something extraordinary that no other hyena has been recorded as doing. Let's go around. We can go around. We're not going to disturb anybody. All the others have moved off. I don't think I can take much more hyena drama. I think, I, oh, I think I'm going to go back to the elephants. I'm not going to go back to the elephants, I promise. Oh, Polar. We actually don't know, Jennifer. That's a point. Jennifer wants to know if Polar Bear only had one cub. I actually don't know. We never clarified. We never confirmed. Hey, Polar. I, don't, I didn't know Polar very well up until this point. This was the first time I really would have been able to recognize her. You might hear a helicopter, by the way. It's been flying all day. For another sad story, it's been flying all day to look for the snared baby elephant. I don't know if they've been successful. I don't think so. I haven't heard anything about it. But we're going to keep looking and we'll, we'll find the baby. We'll find the baby elephant and we'll get the snare off. But just in case you're wondering about that helicopter, people have been looking all day. We've been, Safari Live's been down to the border looking. So we're looking. Oh, now I can smell that there was a dead cub. It's so hard to tell because hyenas are such stinky creatures. Unfortunately, I mean, I love hyenas, but they are smelly. I don't think Waffles killed that cub. Not actively. Passively, possibly. But not actively. I have never, ever seen her display any, any form of serious aggression to any of her clan members. Dominance, yes. Aggression, no. I have never seen her. I don't think it was her. But not actively. Passively, possibly. And that's unusual for a high-ranking hyena because the biggest threat to hyena cubs is other female hyenas with cubs. Especially high-ranking ones. Oh, Polar. 
Oh, hold on everyone, it's a bit muddy and a bit slippery. The worst possible den in the world. Aunt Jo, yes, it's normal for mother hyenas to eat. It's actually normal for all predators to eat their young if they die. It's a normal reaction. Let's just listen to this. Now Waffles is looking for her cubs. They went down the hole and she can't get them back out again. <laughs> nice bottom, Waffles. Thank you for that. Yes, it's normal. Resources. It's nature's equation. The cub is dead. And as sad as that is, the mother is the one most in need of the resources so that she can produce another litter, unfortunately. What baffles me, what astounds me, is that Waffles didn't eat it. Waffles who gets the best of every meal. She didn't eat it, she treated it so gently earlier. So gently. That's what makes me think she didn't actively kill it. I don't know. I'm putting a human emotion on a hyena. Now we've lost both of our main characters on Earth. I have no idea. Could be Teddy Bear. She's been hanging around recently. I don't think it's Teddy, though. Polo's up again. Did she have two? Or has she just not realized the reality? Oh, fair enough. I said that I didn't think that Waffles actively killed the polar bear's cub, but she, she might have passively killed it. What I mean by that is that Waffles' cubs and polar bear's cubs were in the same hole, the same entrance hole to a den. Why polar bear didn't move it, I don't know. Maybe Waffles' cubs insinuated themselves there and she couldn't get to it. But what I mean is that Waffles might have spent so much time with her cubs blocking the entrance and stopping Polar Bear from getting to her cub that the little cub might not have had the nutrients that it needed to survive this cold snap. Because they are so small and that den was very waterlogged. So that's what I mean by passively contributing to the cub's death. But Waffles needs to go and eat and drink. I've, she wasn't at the den earlier, and Polar Bear was. In the times that I've been here, she's Polar Bear's had about four hours to herself at the den in which to, to come and feed her cub. So I don't quite understand exactly what happened. We'll never know. We'll never know. I'm sorry. Oh. And this period of mourning could go on for quite a while. Calling for her cub. Alright. I'm going to wait and see if Waffles' little ones are suckling. Or if she manages to get them out of that incredibly deep hole that they've disappeared into. Let's go back to James, who's searching for things around and about. I'm going backwards. That's what I'm up to. I'm going backwards. In so many ways, I'm just going backwards. It is a bit of an emotional roller coaster going on in East Africa there. I wanted to know from Jamie, and I don't know if she's mentioned this or not, if perhaps Waffles' as cubs had not killed Polar Bear's cub. I thought that might be quite an interesting one. Of course, they are dominant. They will inherit their mother's dominance. Hyena cubs are famous for siblicide. So that's quite interesting. It's quite sad though. I, it's funny though, it's... Um, I was just thinking how people would feel if polar bear eats her cub. Well, how would they feel in comparison with if, let's say, little Clalamba was to somehow meet her end, perish the thought, and Tandy ate her cub, and I decided that I think that it's almost because of us being humans, for me anyway, I don't know what it's like for you, it almost feels like it's appropriate for the hyenas and inappropriate for the leopards, which of course is totally ridiculous.
is something about those hyenas that, um, I don't know, makes me feel like that. As many of you will know, I've been reading this book on stress hormones, and I like to talk about the book I'm reading from time to time because it helps me remember what I've read. And <laughs> interestingly, female hyenas do not produce a huge amount of testosterone. They produce another male hormone. Now, do you think I can remember the name of that male hormone? It's called androtestodione. There you go, androtestodione. Can you believe it? I remembered it. Androtestodione. And it is that that gives them their size and their secondary male or masculine characteristics. Androtestodione. Hooray. Can you believe it? Androtestodione. Let me tell you, when you get into hormones, there are a number of words that you just know and accept you will never remember. But androtestodione, I remembered. As I have remembered, luteinizing releasing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, testosterone, of course, progesterone. But luteinizing releasing hormone is the, the most difficult one I've remembered so far, other than androtestodione. Alrighty, what we're doing now is going a little bit towards the south to see if we cannot find some tracks of uh, Tandi and Tlalamba around here. I don't think they're around here. I think they're probably quite close to Hosanna. Sydney, however, seems to have caught up with another member of the Royal Leopard lineage. I have got one of those bears that are good indicators of a prey. Some of them are on the ground, whereas some of them are high up by the trees. You can see the very beautiful silhouette. So these birds, I am trying to use them in order to investigate where uh, uh, Kuchava's carcass might be lying at the moment. As here is where Kuchava was hiding the food this morning. So I have not yet picked up any of the food. These are the Warbeg vultures. You cannot see them very nicely because there is very much dark. So, but um, I strongly believe that these vultures are going to give us good updates this afternoon. So I just want to try and show you the ones that are on the ground. Maybe you can see them nicely. Yeah, it seems like they are feeding on something here. Can you see that? They are feeding on something there. So look at that. Yeah, there is some, some meat on the ground there. So these vultures are not just here looking, they are here because they know there's food available. Maybe that is the carcass which has been left behind by Kuchava. You can see that by the neck they don't even have hairs there so that they can be able to penetrate in between the body to get hold of the food. They are stepping on the meat and pull it up. So that hook beak is very much sharp. So these birds are very much big and they can wing spread two and a half meters. You can see that they don't just concentrate on feeding. They feed and also watch out for their predators. They consider their safety the most. You can see that they're checking every time. Jen, the vultures do eat the elephants. I have seen it happening. I saw them eating the elephant. The thing is, the carcass, when it's still very fresh, yes, you might find that the skin is still very much um, strong, but as time goes on, when it's starting to rot and become a carry-on, they can easily... Remember, this kind of bears, they don't only prey on fresh meat. They do sometimes eat carrions and it's one of those bears that help us a lot because eating carrions help us in order to get rid of the diseases you can see that the one on the left is still a juvenile
Uh, this is beautiful. I'm just going to go there and check later on to see what kind of prey was that one. Just to verify if it was the prey which has been taken down by Kuchava. If it is, it means these vultures took it up from the tree. I'm not very sure uh, at uh, what degree they can be able to steer the head. But if you can check there, the, the neck is a little bit much longer. So that gives them access in order to turn their head. So these birds, they don't just fly. It's one of those birds that fly considering thermal. These birds have got a very good eyesight and they can be able to see thermal. So they can be able to see hot air evaporating from the bare patches on the ground. Fascinating, isn't it? So some of them are still high up by the trees. There's only two on the ground trying to feed. But now I'm going to have to carry on and see if we can find Kuchaba, the one I am suspecting that this kill has been taken from. This is quite a beautiful sighting. It's the first time for me since I've arrived here in order to see the vultures feeding on the ground. But now we can go back to James and see. James may be still with Hosanna on the other side. I am going to now try by all means to get hold of Kuchava because now I'm convinced that Kuchava is still in the area because the food, it is still here. Oh, fascinating that he's found the food but not the leopard. That's really odd. I'm sure she must be. I'm sure he's right. She must be around there somewhere. You could easily be lurking in the shade quite close to the lodge. What we've done is come down to the central parts of Juma. I'm not in search of anything hugely particular. Uh, Rexon did reckon that there were some leopard tracks around here earlier today. Uh, there were some vultures around, so perhaps we'll get lucky. I find it much better not to focus too much on trying to find something because uh, almost universally that doesn't happen. Now, I don't know about you but you know I was always taught as a child that you need to uh, visualize thing, things that you want you know and I for example visualized myself playing for the first 15 rugby team uh, more times than I uh, care to remember. I visualized myself uh, in various romantic situations with ladies that I quite liked. I visualized myself doing various other heroic things. I can say without question that not one of my visualizations ever came to fruition. And I think that either I'm very bad at visualization or perhaps I am is, what called a, is what's called a regressive visualizer whereby whatever I visualize doesn't come to pass. And so what I'm going to do now is try not to visualize seeing anything that I really want to see. See if that works. <laughs> yes, exactly. The hiccup trick, don't think of a white horse. Something like that. This, of course, is where Tlalamba was born, in that termite mound over there on the other side. It's quite close to where uh, Tristan was nearly eaten by Tlalamba, uh, not Tlalamba, by Tandi, on his finding them. <laughs> <laughs> Tandi took offence at Tristan arriving at the den site and finding where she had stashed her cub and it's because it's very easy to give Tandi offence Okay, we're now coming down towards where I thought the vultures were. They've taken off and gone somewhere else as the heat of the day is built. So I think whatever they were looking at has gone. But that's okay. It's a beautiful afternoon out 
in the Western Kruger National Park. I'm going to try and find some other signs of spring, perhaps. The sun is slowly starting to set. We did go to Bovazuk Dam as well. There was absolutely nothing there. And the reason there was nothing there is because I think the dam is almost empty and the mud is actually sticking out through the water. All right, well, I could waffle on possibly until the cows come home. And before the cows get home, Sydney has got some walchas to show you. The vultures are still enjoying their meal here and I can see some of them have just arrived now. You can see up by that tree that is not one or two anymore. It's quite a lot of them. So they're just going to have now their afternoon meal before they go back to rest. So look at that. So you can see he's trying to do something. I cannot see very well what he's doing, but apparently Kuchawa has been spotted and then I'm just trying to get some updates now. I am now on the queue. The chances of us seeing Kuchawa uh, this afternoon, they are very much high. I am on a queue now, so I will be standing by here with the vultures until they call me in. So I'm just trying to see if there is any other piece of meat left there where that uh, vulture is trying to uh, feed or else maybe it's trying to just clean itself. Very much difficult to see from where I am if uh, there is anything left still up by that tree or maybe something that uh, that vulture got from the ground. And Gian, the vultures, they don't have any other option. They've got to uh, catch some of these uh, meat and the carrions in order to give their little ones. Remember, these kind of birds don't go out for hunting purposes. They go out in order to see if they can find peace from the predators and from the animals that are dying naturally. So they don't only scavenge the animals that has been caught from predation purposes. Also animals that are dying naturally, they do eat them. And they can be able to travel very long distances. This is one of the birds that can fly very high up, but still can be able to see what's happening on the ground. So these birds can be able to distinguish between a dead animal and an animal that is just sleeping. You will never see them coming down to inspect a sleeping animal. But when something is dead, you will see they will come and arrive down right at the location. That tells you these animals can see very well because they don't detect this kind of carcass from sense of smell. They see. Mr. Public, these kind of birds, remember when they are feeding on a carcass, a carcass is consisted of steak, meat, and the bones. So when they are feeding, they can easily automatically sharpen their teeth while they are feeding because they do bite some of the bones. So that helps them. And I can promise you the beak for the vultures is very much sharp. I was once involved on a sighting where one of the vulture got caught by the electric line, but he was still alive. We had to rescue that vulture. I was with my colleague from my previous uh, place, and while we were trying to catch him, the first thing he did when he's irritated, he started vomiting so that he can be able to lose the weight and try to run away. But to contain that vulture, it took much time because he was trying to bite and he did manage to bite my colleague and he was badly injured. He even went for consultation because uh, as vultures eat carrions, it's not safe uh, to just leave it like that. 
So I'm just going to try and move forward a, a little bit so that we can have a good sighting. Can you see them nicely here, Feg? So now uh, my camera operator is preferring this position so that you can see these vultures very well. Now I can count one, two, three. So, but some are still here on the ground. Uh, this is one of the very interesting sightings. But as soon as the sun goes down, they are going to sleep. But already in the very same area, while here by this vulture sighting, I can hear the pale spotted owls, they are already calling. They are preparing now to come out also to do their activities. I am not hearing anything yet with regards to the sighting for Kuchava, but uh, I am uh, still on a queue and I'm not going to leave here until we see Kuchava this afternoon. But uh, while waiting for the queue in order to see Kuchava, let's go to Masai Mara and see Jeremy. Uh, there is some interesting things happening there. I'm not too sure what kind of sighting Jeremy is having at the moment, but I know that by Masai Mara things are happening at the moment. It's been both heartbreaking, but at the same time, fascinating is the wrong word. It's not the word I'm looking for. I guess educational would be what I'm looking for. A really unique insight into a momentous moment in North Clan. I suppose not even that momentous for them. This sort of stuff happens all the time, but we very seldom get to see it. But I'm not going to dwell on Polar Bear looking for her cub. It's too terribly sad. So we're going to leave her to her morning, unless, of course, she has a second one, which, you know, at this rate, the, the way they're churning out surprises could easily be. Interesting. Nature at its harshest, I guess. And sloth bear... Polar Bear's little brother ingratiating himself to Waffles, who's come out covered in mud. Carrie, a gesta the gestation period of a hyena is usually about three months, give or take. I mean, it's unique to each animal, but it's around about there. And when they lose cubs, if they lose cubs, <clears throat> it takes them about two months or so for their bodies to recover and for them to become fertile again. So there's a five month gap. If a hyena, if a female hyena loses cubs, there's a five month gap until she will have her next litter at least, if not more. And they've got quite long birthing intervals as well. So for example, Soup, Waffles' granddaughter, will not be having cubs for another year or so. I'm going to give you one last look of polar bear and then we can answer questions as we move away. I'm going to leave her to her search. Sorry, girl. I feel almost guilty I treated it with relief. But it's human, I think. Spent more time with Waffles. I know Waffles better. I know her story better and I know how old she is. Relief was the wrong word. And off she goes. You're going to go torment the elephants again. They've been, they've been backwards and forwards with these elephants all day. I don't know where she's going. But she's, very up that she's left a very upset elephant in her wake. Now what? Now she's left. I'll tell you what. We'll put it to a vote as a polar bear goes racing off into the distance to who knows where. Turning elephant heads as she goes. What would you like to do? Would you like to stay and see if Waffles' cubs come back out and we can spend a little bit of time with them? Or shall we leave North Clan for today and go off in search of something else? I'm not going to the Olololos, unfortunately, because that way, and they are sort of in that general western direction, is one solid wall of rain as it has been pretty much all day. Maybe if it clears we can go in that direction, but I don't think so. 
gives you an idea of how muddy it is down there because she went right in that hole and look how she's come out. She's filthy. Not that a hyena minds. Just quickly, to clarify for, for any new viewers, the reason that she's wearing a collar is not because she's a domestic hyena. These hyenas are researched. So I think that this sometimes causes confusion for viewers who perhaps are too shy to ask about it. They are researched and tracked by the Michigan State University Mara Hyena Project. So that's why she wears a collar. It is not a GPS collar. It is a telemetry collar, meaning it can only be utilized by those who have her her coordinate oh sorry not her frequency and of course a telemetry kit whatever else we may say about waffle she is not oh brrr. <laughs> the elephant's chasing Okay, I'm going to let you decide what it is we do and where we go. So while you think about that, why don't, why don't you spend some time with James? Yes, hello everybody. We're back again. We've uh, had a short break, got off the car to see if we could find what some babblers were shouting at. The babblers were shouting at babblers, funnily enough which is of course uh, the major thing that babblers shout at. Babblers do shout, sometimes shout at leopards, but in this case the babblers were shouting at other babblers. I'm not going to say the word babbler once more today, at least. We're going to slowly make our way back towards Hoshana as the sun sets. We've failed to come up with any other high-profile game sighting around where we've searched today. We did have an elephant right outside of camp. Unfortunately, I didn't bother to try and re-find him. So intent was I on the cats and their fascination, or the fascination that they hold for us. Hopefully, Siddhas will be able to find Guchava soon. I believe he, she has been found. So I think he's just going to have to try and find out where he is. The roads on Chitwa are still a bit of a mystery to us. But the sitters will probably get in there. By us, I don't mean Tristan, of course. He did work there, so he knows precisely where he is all the time. Uh, we'll probably have a little sunset shot now, I think, David. What do you say? Yeah, it's very nice. I'm going to stop on the top of this bump. Are you ready? And there we go. It's still quite bright. but it's very gold. <gasps> Look at that. It is bright though. Oh, there we go. Now you can see it, sort of. I can't see anything right now. I made the mistake of looking directly into the sun like a foolish child. <laughs> That's very pretty indeed, from what I can see. The picture I can see has got now oh, 24 suns in it. Right, good, that was the sunset. I hope you enjoyed it, everybody. Well done for screenshotting it. Of course, we do get to see that every single day, which is a whoops, great pleasure. Using the clutch is not a great pleasure, clearly. No, very few bird species will breed year-round, as far as I'm aware, but some will breed in winter, and the most notable example of that at the moment is the white-backed vulture, Hello Nyalas. Uh, they breed all year round. No, let's carry on, he doesn't want to see us. Not all year round, they breed in the winter time, so their chicks have just been born round about now. I don't think there are any birds that have babies all the time. I can't think of any. Certainly none of the migratory species, obviously. I'm trying to think of any others that may perhaps... No, I don't think there are. There are a few that will breed in winter, but I don't think any of them will have uh, young all year round. For the birds, almost universally, there is better food available in summer than there is in winter. Much better. And so they will normally 
try and have babies during the most plentiful time of the year and that's possibly why vultures have their babies at this time of the year because of course we're coming to the end of the dry season which means that it's good hunting time for a lot of the animals or a lot of the predators which means that there's oh, there's also going to be deaths from the uh, of old and sick has become to the most difficult time of the year for the animals and so possibly for a vulture there's more to eat at the moment than there would be at other times of the year it's the only reason i can think of that they should breed now i'm talking specifically of the white-backed vulture i'm not sure about the others i think a few other raptor species also breed in the winter patrick um, everything is t uh, affected by drought to a greater or lesser extent birds as well I'm 99% sure what I've seen here is a uh, log. And I'm not even going to show David what it is because it is a log and I'm embarrassed now. Well done. Uh, what was that? I've forgotten what Patrick said now because I was so embarrassed. Birds. What was it? Any... Typically affected by drought. Anything is affected by drought, Patrick. Um, you know, uh, seed eaters, there won't be nearly as many seeds on the plants in, the, in a drought. Fruit eaters, uh, well, fruit trees don't produce their fruit when there's no water. Um, I suppose for initially some of the raptors and some of the scavenging birds would do well out of a drought because of the death of various things. Um, some of the herbivores will drop dead, of course, during a drought and that sort of thing. But you must remember, of course, what are these people looking at? Do you think it's a leopard? I don't want to drive in their way. Oh, he's waving at us in a very friendly manner. Uh, well, oh, I think he's taking pictures or something. I don't know what he's doing. Anyway, um, but then, so even after the, if, if the predatory birds do well in a drought, no problem. Uh, what will happen is that because the animals are dying, rather like happened with the lions with their white muscle disease, you'll find that the meat that they're eating will be nutrient poor. And after a while, therefore, even the scavenging birds will start to suffer from a drought. There is the elephant that was in camp. He's now on the damn wall. Let us go and visit with him. I think those people are actually on the telephone. They have found a piece of signal, and of course, um, they're now greeting their loved ones. Oh, and two elephants, and the necking giraffe. My goodness gracious, everybody, I don't know where to look. Apparently, these giraffe have been having at each other for some time now. There they are, in the riverbed below the dam wall. Now they seem to be pretending to be friends. Very difficult to tell, of course, because they can't snarl at each other like cats can, or swear at each other like humans can. They just have to follow each other around with that rather docile, friendly look on their faces. No doubt they're communicating with each other in some way. Ah, very good news. Uh, while we sit here and try and clear this roadblock from elephants, uh, let's go across to Siddhas, who has got Tundi's daughter on the move. Here comes Tandi's daughter, Kuchava. I am very lucky with Kuchava this afternoon. I haven't seen Kuchava for quite a long time. The last time I've seen Kuchava, it was my first game drive here in Juma while Kuchava was fighting the other family members on the other side. Look at that. This is beautiful. If you can look at this cat very nicely, just behind the ears, there is some black marks and these white tips. 
So the leopards, their ears are completely different from the one of the lions. Lions, the tips are just black. For the leopard, it's white. So that white color is the one that they use uh, for communication as a follow me sign when they are talking to the little ones. And look at those whiskers. So those whiskers are those uh, equipments which helps them in order to measure the space in between the branches. So Kuchawa and Tandi, they do have problems at the moment because the cats, they, they normally drive away the other individual of the same sex. And that is very normal to the cats. Both male and females, they do that. And both male and females, they are territorial. So the territorial males can also overlap their territories into the female's territories. That is allowed. But the problem is only if it's the same sex. So the different sex, they do welcome overlap. So, but uh, to me, it's not fair. They were supposed to just try and share the territories together. Now this is a phenomenal sighting as Kuchawa. We haven't seen her for quite a long time here in Juma. I am right by the Chitwa area, which is very far away from where we are seeing Tandi, Kalamba, as well as Tingana. So I am very far away from that area at the moment. So it's difficult to see so animals such as Tingana. We see them the most because they've got a huge responsibility of trying to investigate and to advertise their presence every time in their territory. Look at that. This is beautiful. Very much relaxed. Not worried about anything. Very, very much camouflage. This spot helps them a lot in order to match the surrounding. Closing the eyes, looks very tired. This Kuchawa has got quite a lot of light coloring. That is very true compared to uh, Tandi. Tandi is very much uh, dark. It's golden dark color of tandy also looks very much beautiful so i'm just going to try and move forward so that uh, feg can show you a nice view Much better now, we can see her very nicely. You can see the tip of the ears nicely there and these rosette spots shining. This is very much light. So Kuchaba must be full at the moment as this morning was spotted eating. The food that we saw earlier on taken by the vultures, it was apparently the remains which was from Kuchaba this morning. So Kuchawa is going to get very worried when going back to that area because maybe the vultures took that carcass away from Kuchawa from the tree. Because how I saw the vultures eating, it was showing that there were still quite a lot of meat available there. So maybe he's going to go back there to try and check if there's still some food available. Kuchava is sleeping as if it was not active. It's like we found her sleeping like that. Unbelievable that we found Kuchava mobiling about three minutes ago, but now it's completely flat. So these kind of cats, in terms of the size, they might be looking... So this is uh, Tandy's daughter. It's just that the cats, they grow very fast. And uh, unfortunately, when they're growing, when they 
they go through all the trainings when they're still very young, five months, six months, they learn to hunt. After a year, effectively, they can hunt. When they're close to two years and over two years is when they're going to have to be kicked out in order to perform their own life. Now, Kuchaba is solitary, which is very much normal. Sometimes they do meet with Tandi, but there are always conflict in between them. So now let's go back to James, who is having the elephant drinking water at the moment. Elephants, they've got to drink quite a lot of water every day. Well, it's not very warm here, I'll tell you that for free. I've put my jacket on, so is David. But these elephants, two young bulls, magnificent fellows, are having a little drink. I think they're probably in the region of 18 to 20 years. The one on the right, probably about 20. The one on the left, about 18. They've just left home. So they're hanging around like two young bucks. Still have to do their studies before they can be adults. No responsibilities. Just enjoying life. Very nice, David. I see that you've managed to suck some pink out of the sky where I cannot see it with my own eyes. That's very clever of you. I must confess that that picture that you're looking at there is a lot pinker than the one I'm looking at with my eyes. The water looks like jelly, almost. Very nice. Elephants drinking is a very peaceful thing to watch. Yes, Mr. Public, synchronized drinking. Isn't it a wonder? They've been practicing all day. There, they've got that movement a bit wrong, unless they're doing that on purpose. There we go. Yes, it was choreographed, you can see. It's very... Uh, I don't think it's very impressive, synchronized drinking, I must say. It's not something I pay to come and see. Yes, there you are. The water where I'm sitting looks pretty green, but it does have a fresh sort of, um, what? It has a fresh influx of water every day. This is a pumped pan. That's one of the reasons that as the dry season gets really heavy, it's going to become a real focal point for the animals here. And the big chap just, I think, giving the little one there a little bit of a head nod to say, come on, young fellow, let's get going. I'm in charge here. You have to do what I tell you to do. The little chap's a little bit rebellious, you see, he's not interested. He says, I do what I want to do. But eventually he's going to get nervous being all on his lonesome, and I think he'll turn and follow his slightly older friend. I actually think the other one's probably a little bit older than 20. Probably in the region of 25. So much more experienced than the smaller one. And that's quite a common arrangement, that a younger bull will hang around with a older one. Calcix, yes, uh, elephants often fall prey to, um, to terrapins, biting their trunks and then pulling them into the water and devouring them. They become like piranhas. You know, one will grab the trunk, pull the elephant in, and then the rest will devour the thing in seconds, really. I'm obviously being completely facetious. I, um, I, I imagine it's possible that a very stupid terrapin might have a bite or nip at an elephant's trunk. But, you know, we've seen them swimming around buffalo, picking the ticks off them, so I think the terrapins understand what's mammalian and what isn't and what's uh, possible for them to eat and what isn't. So now I'm going to say no, I don't think that a terrapin would have a go at an elephant's trunk, but there's no telling with a terrapin. Unpredictable creatures... 
variable IQs, one of the particularly low IQ and huge ambition to impress the others might have a go at an elephant. David, you haven't seen any terrapins having a go there, have you? He's a lovely fellow. He's also not vaguely worried that his friend has absconded. There he goes, wandering off into the bushes. This little fellow's had a much thirstier day, obviously. Um, we could escape. I, I don't know, really. He's saying now, wait for me, wait for me. I think you probably find they do favour one leg over the other. In the same way that they favour one tusk over the other tusk. Yeah, so they probably are right or left footed to a certain extent. I'm not sure how many animals are like that. In my days of riding horses when I was young, um, some horses definitely favoured one side over the other, but that seemed to have much more to do with how stiff they were than with how, um, you know, genetically predisposed they were to use one side of their bodies. That's a beautiful picture there of him disappearing down into what was once a riverbed. And if you can believe it, we have yet another visitor to the waterhole. There. Can you see it, David? It's just there. There. Right, well done. It is a water buck. We just come down to the water. Yes, it is confused slightly by the wall there that has been created. I see that our nest cam is almost submerged. I think that we should perhaps warn Conrad of that eventuality. I'm not sure if it's waterproof or not. Is the nest cam waterproof? If not, Conrad, I suspect that, yeah, well, your day is about to become fairly busy tomorrow. Conrad apparently has just fallen off his chair and is now wailing and gnashing his teeth. Well, there's the water buck now staring into one of the nest cams. <laughs> it's probably quite a nice picture from there. He's not worried about being destroyed here. Right, Guchava is now awake, as is Sydney. Not that he was ever asleep. Let's go across to them. It seems like uh, Kuchava was just pretending sleeping because now I can see Kuchava is up and running. The stomach is full, but that does not mean if anything comes here, it's not going to get caught. The cats, sometimes they take down animals in order to see that they can take down something. The fact that the bellies are full does not mean if anything comes closer, they're not going to take action about it. They will. So if you can check, Kuchawa managed to catch something this morning. It's just that I'm not too sure what animal it was. But what I want to explain here is that these cats, they are solitary. And the lions, they travel as a group. The leopards, they've got much more strength than the lions. And they can easily be able to take something very high up in the tree. So while I'm seeing Kuchawa, I can see this, even water box here. So maybe it's what made Kuchawa to try and investigate just earlier on. Look there, I've got some water bugs passing by. So there is the male water bug at a distance of about approximately uh, 250 meters away from Kuchawa. But I think that one is too big for Kuchawa as the lepers, they prefer to take down something which is between 10 to uh, 40 kilograms. So the water bug is 270 kilograms. That is too big. 
look at that. Very much inquisitive. And this is not only about animals coming, also about their own safety. They must have to be wary all the time. As we all know that the leopards and the lions, they don't really get along. Every time lions want to take down leopards. Now this is a beautiful view. Look at those eyes. Alone, Kuchawa can be able to take something way much bigger than her own weight, which can go up to approximately 65 to 70 kilograms. That tells you that this animal is powerful. Climbing a tree holding something is never easy. You can see that she's really concentrating on something. So what I like about these cats is that even if I'm not seeing what they're trying to get hold of, they will show me. Because I know that my eyes are not strong as their eyes. So I'm every time guided by their concentration. If there is anything coming, they will show me. Just like what they did now now when they have shown me the water bark. So now, because uh, the sun has just died, we are going now on infrared so that we can have better visuals of these animals. Look at that now on infrared, completely different. This is beautiful. So now that Kuchawa got something, it means uh, she will just have to be going to the water hole for drinking most of the times. But when going there, chances of encountering some of the other prey are very high. As since I've been here in Chitwa looking for Kuchawa, I have seen quite a whole lot of stian buckies here. And those are the kind of preferable sizes of the leopards. That is not an alarm call. That is also one of the calls uh, from the uh, Francolin. So the Francolins now, before they sleep, they are also very territorial, like what leopard does where you will hear the male sowing. So the Francolins must also have to make that kind of a territorial call in order to alert their neighboring uh, territorial males that they still own this territory. Okay, now he's falling asleep again. So by looking at the facial expression of uh, uh, Kuchava, you can see that this Kuchava have not yet encountered uh, some of the other leopards fighting as there are no scratches there. This kind of cats, their claws can be very much sharp and some of them you will see with the scratches here on the face as they clap each other, scratch each other. As time goes on, when starting to challenge the other uh, animals of the same species in the area, we will start to see some scratches. That is why old cats, they are having a lot of scratches on them. Mrs. Anna, this is indeed quite a lovely cat. Kuchava is very much beautiful. So you can see the spots, as I indicated earlier, they are completely different in terms of the coloring compared to Tandy. And that tells you that each one of them has got its own stripe pattern and its own coloration on the stripes. So now, while still waiting for any action taken forward by uh, Kuchawa, I am going to uh, 
and uh, now leave you with James who is also looking for some of the interesting animals. Well, we're on our way into Hosanna now. I'm just trying to see if there is a space for us. Somebody said they would move out. I just need to make sure that they have moved out. Also, the photographers are going to leave very shortly because, frankly, if they're taking pictures in this light, the torture to which their poor families are going to be subjected once they get home and try and show them pictures of leopard spots in the dark see where it will go. It looks like Hosanna has not moved at all. His diker still rests peacefully in its tree. Well, it doesn't really have a choice but to rest peacefully. It's not like it could get up and go for a run. I don't think that Hosanna has moved at all. Anna, my favorite animal to track is the white rhinoceros. The reason for that is because the white rhinoceros is easy to track. Um, well, certainly much easier than many other animals. In comparison with the leopard, which is frankly impossible to... Oh, there he is. He's that, he's that spotted thing over there, Dave. He seems to be a little offended that we managed to drive straight past him without seeing him. How's that, Dov? Is that okay for now? We'll just stop here for now. Let's see if he doesn't go up and eat his hors d'oeuvre. Ah, oh, no, he's coming to say hello to us because he likes us. Hello, fellow. Yes. There are certainly many photographs being taken. Oh. There's even a very wide-angled lens being used. It's going to be particularly torturous for the viewer. Well, Jonathan, we're not so much food as we are friend, I think. Hello. Hello, Hosanna. Now, the one thing you are not allowed to do over there is go to the loo, please, if you don't mind. The temptation to get out and give him a cuddle is overwhelming. <laughs> but I don't think I will. We can try and move. Oh, he's going behind us. No, he's stopped now. He looks like he might get onto the spare wheel. Can you see him, Dov? Is he sitting? He's just standing, apparently. So behind us that we can't actually see him. Um, he's so... <laughs> oh, there he is. You're going to sit down there, are you? Ah. Oh. Now, when I was speaking earlier about him being a social cat, well, I think that's sort of what I was talking about. I can't really see a reason for him to have come to us or come to us this closely. But there he is, sitting there more than a metre at the car, eyeballing David in the small picnic that he brought with him. Bits of fruit. I think David's finished his picnic. Oh, let's look at the Fleur picture quickly. I oh, know, David, it's going to be difficult for you. Are you all right? Can we? Oh, we don't have Fleur. That's a very strange thing. We don't have Fleur in the final control, I'm afraid. That is the thermal camera that we use. Now, I just wonder if he's not smelling, perhaps. Yeah, he is. Look at his Fleming grimacing. Now he's doing that to interpret what he's smelling there, and I suspect he's smelling other leopards. Now Tingana, well Tristan reckoned that 
pretty much every lip in the Sabi Sands was in this block this morning. He reckoned that he found Hukumuri tracks. Uh, I think that there were Tingana tracks perhaps, Tandi and Tlalamba maybe in this block. And so it's entirely possible that what we have here is him trying to interpret which leopards have gone past here. That look at him flim and grimacing there. Right, we have the Flier now. Let's go to the Flier. There we are. And look at his spots. See how his spots are slightly different colours? Isn't that cool? I know that this is an awkward angle, everybody, but I cannot move the car at this stage on account of the fact that we are no more than well, half a metre from him, just over a foot and a half. Definitely interpreting some strange smells, I think, on that bush there. Indicating, perhaps, that it was Hukumuri that came past this area. Fascinating. <laughs> oh yes, Minamu, uh, you'll find that most of the antelope that have horns out here use their horns almost exclusively for fighting with each other and not for defence. And so absolutely they can hunt animals with big horns. It's very easy for them to hunt animals with big horns. Well, not very easy, but, it, you know, the horns are almost meaningless when it comes to defence. Notable exception, of course, would be buffalo, but you would never find a leopard really hunting an adult buffalo. There we go. He's going back to his kill now, perhaps. <laughs> there he goes. Let me get out of your way. If he goes back towards the tree now. Beautiful. Okay, and we're now in perfect position to get back to the tree, so let's go back to Gutrava while we get into a good position here. Kuchawa is still sleeping and uh, Kuchawa is trying to prove me wrong as what I know is that the lepers, they are most active between dawn, uh, between dusk and dawn. So, but now it's dusk already and Kuchawa is still sleeping and is lying down flat. These kind of animals, they can walk very long distances at night. So they can be able to walk up to approximately 25 kilometers one night. But when disturbed, they can travel long distances than that. They can even cover far as 75 kilometers. So you can see that after a meal, they just have to lie down. So now let's go back to James and see Hosanna is doing more activities than Kuchava. It looks like he's going to go back up his tree, everybody, to snack on his hors d'oeuvre, as I said. We've got ourselves into quite a nice position here. He's going up the back of the tree, which to the photographers is going to be something difficult. Tax on Roger Vaughan. Tax? I'm just trying to ask Taxon if his guests can see. Oh, and see you turn. There we go. Up he goes. Beautiful. He must feel like he's on stage. No, Emma is not unusually graceful. He's very graceful always. And the ascent, it's the descent that he's uh, not particularly good at, but no male leopard is. Oh, that's a wonderful shot. Isn't that beautiful? Now, oh, the K2 
kill is across and up the other side. So he's got to go across to that other fork and then all the way up. I, th I think it's there, yes, I think it is. So there could be quite a spectacular jump coming up. He's still trying to interpret the signs. Here he goes. Oh, very impressive. Look at that. Jonathan, no, I have never seen a leopard fishing. I have seen footage of leopard fishing, but I've never actually seen them do it myself. I've seen him eating terrapins. Oh, that is really rather gruesome, isn't it? Still he has to eat. That's wonderful. We managed to get ourselves into rather a good position here, didn't we, Delvid? We've had a fantastic sighting, actually. Mm. Now, there is a hyena somewhere lurking around here. <laughs> oh, he's, got a, <laughs> he's got a very large piece of meat there. Oh, it's the guts. That's why he's looking less than... See how he's squeezing it out? So he's enjoying the lining, but not the inside. That is astounding. That is really skillful. It is amazing. He's hoping it's going to burst, you see, so that all that yuckiness falls to the floor. Ooh. There it goes. Oh, that is utterly foul. Oh, I'm sorry about this, everybody. <laughs> Good grief, that is disgusting. That is utterly unbelievable. Highly skillful, as Emma says, and disgusting to the nth degree. Wait till he spits it out. Then you're really going to be ill. I do apologise, everybody. Oh, wow. How do you... Oh, I'm feeling quite nauseous. Oh. Yeah. Yes, oh, thank goodness it's gone. Let's see if the hyena comes in to take the rest of that. Yes, I'm, many of you, I'm sure, feeling as nauseous as I am, probably going to have to have a lie down in a few minutes. What a grief, yes. Well, that's better. That's uh, slightly less disgusting. Bit of steak and bone grizzle. Phew. Well, let's go and find out if Guchava, his cousin, I suppose you might say, uh, let's go and find out if she's found her food. Guchava is trying to show us here that uh, she can sleep. She doesn't want to wake up at all. She's not even looking at us anymore. It seems like Kuchaba knows very well that the food she left up by the tree has been taken by the vultures. Maybe before we got there, there has been some confrontations. I'm not sure because I can see that she's not even showing any sign of going back there. So these kind of uh, animals, the cats, after their meal, they've got to lie down for long, long periods so that they can at least allow the digestive system to uh, break down everything. So sometimes when they're eating there, they even eat some of the hairs and you will see them trying to coffee some uh, hairballs out so that they don't get constipated in the stomach. If it was not the flare camera, I can promise you it was going to be very difficult for me to see that cat is hiding very nicely there. But to her, she's not hiding. This is normal. The design is the one which is making her camouflaged.
So you can see that these spots are part of the uh, predation strategies so that the prey cannot be able to identify them when they are hunting. But the prey as well, they do also develop some of the anti-predatory strategies. That is why if you can check the animals that are prefers the most to buy this kind of cats, those that are weighing uh, between 10 to 40 kilograms, they prefer the densely populated area. And when the, the leopards are looking for them by the densely populated areas, they can easily go cover by cover, which is then becomes very difficult for a prey to identify them when they are slowly approaching. Leopards don't really go, they don't really prefer to go after the animals that are occurring by the very big open space because they know those ones are well equipped with the good anti-predatory strategies. So now let's go back to Osana. I think there is a little bit of a drama going on there. The hyenas, they have just arrived. They have just arrived and I think this poor hyena has just had to finish off the utterly vile bit of intestinal viscera that the leopard dropped on the floor. And you can see him there sitting in the purple tree He's the yellow thing. And in case you are a new viewer, this is a thermal camera that is picking up, obviously, temperature differences. You can see that the diker has taken on the same temperature as the tree and has no temperature. Those are its legs, the two purple things that look like little feathers sticking out at the bottom of the branch there. And its temperature is probably roughly the same as that of the tree, which I think, when I looked at the measure, was probably about 21 degrees Celsius or so. So it has taken on the ambient temperature, and you can see that Hosanna's metabolic heat is producing a temperature of somewhere in the region of 37 degrees Celsius, which is, of course, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Unless he's got malaria, which I don't think he does. little darker. He really has had a great time of it of late. Remember he was quite skinny for a little bit while, for a little while. I knew someone was going to ask me this after I made that stupid comment and now and now I'm going to have to answer it yeah, with an I don't know. I don't think so. Jen, I think that malaria is exclusive to human beings because the parasite, the plasmodium parasite, can only be sustained in human blood and mosquito bodies and it needs both hosts, humans and um, and mosquitoes and I do not believe that it's possible in animals. I also think that you'll find that there could be other parasites that affect animals that are related to um, mosquitoes, uh, maybe even versions of plasmodium but I don't think you'll find that the animals here are susceptible to it. I think you'd find that by now they'd be completely immune. Maybe to give them a mild sort of illness, but nothing like malaria does to us. We're going into the malaria season now, and of course malaria does kill an astonishing number of people still. Mr. Public, it does look like a scenario out of a dream, doesn't it? I think let's go back to the normal camera now for the infrared shot. And there you can see what it looks like without the heat signature. And Wicked Scape, the spotlights don't agitate him because he's used to them. He's been around them all his life. Um, he's not trying to hide. He's in a tree. He's comfortable eating his meal. So, you know, I don't think he knows what they are, necessarily. But they don't bug him because he's used to them. 
They definitely bug a few animals. Um, elephants don't like them at all, quite often. Uh, but otherwise, we are... I mean, the reason we don't shine them is that it, on diurnal animals certainly is because it does obviously um, affect their ability to see and defend themselves from predators. But, you know, shining a spotlight on an animal like this in a tree with a meal uh, is very little effect whatsoever. You know, they definitely wouldn't be shining a spotlight on him if he was hunting, for example. We are just very fortunate in that we have the equipment where we don't have to. And of course, if it did bug him, he could just turn around, but he, I don't think it bugs him at all. Good. Very nice. Well, I don't think we're going to go anywhere from here before the end of the drive. Just a few more minutes. And apparently you can hear him crunching away at the bones. Are you sure that's the crunching of bones and not the, um, the clicking of camera shutters? No, that's a meeting. He's using his carnassial teeth to shear the meat off the skin and off the bone. And I would be quite surprised if another leopard didn't wander past here during the night and look what was going on. They'll be able to hear that crunching. So if Tristan is correct, and I've no reason to suspect that he wasn't, that there are other leopards in this area, they will hear that noise and they'll come and investigate. And if one of them happens to be Tingana, well, I'm sorry, then this diker is going to be his for very long. All right, Kuchava seems to have got even fuller than Hosanna. Apparently is moving a little, so let's go and see. Kuchawa is still very much relaxed, not doing anything. Uh, but I cannot blame Kuchawa for sleeping because uh, Kuchawa is territorial. Where she's sleeping now is within her territorial boundary. So she can just sleep lying flat anywhere. So it's like we are in a house here. But maybe some of the animals moving around here might wake her up as uh, I can see that the ears are still very moving. So she's very much conscious, sleeping but listening to what is happening. It seems like now she is really enjoying her sleep. She is right on deep sleep now. So I'm going to be uh, here waiting just to see if maybe she's going to move because where we are is also not very far away from the water hole. Maybe she might head down to the water hole as I can see the direction she is coming from is not from the water hole. She's not there yet for the day. It's very much easy to walk right onto this cat when it's uh, lying down like this. You can see the fluffy coat there. She doesn't look like an animal. If you don't look at this animal as a whole, you can never notice that this is an animal. I'm sure we can see that it's a leopard because we saw it before. But to something else, it doesn't look like an animal. Because if you can check, the part of the stomach which is breathing is hidden by the tall grass. And you can only see that part of the shoulder which is not moving at all and very much camouflaged. And you must remember that this is happening now during the dark. These kind of animals, they don't usually chase animals from far. They let their prey to come much closer 
much closer. Normally, when the prey is closer than 10 meters, 5 meters is when they take it down. They don't want to waste all the energy chasing an animal. They want to catch and waste energy when they are climbing a tree, trying to hide the animal away from the hyenas as they might come to deprive it. Just like what you have just saw now, hyenas under the tree where Hosanna is trying to look around. Elizabeth, that is quite a very interesting question and I am going to answer it broadly. The predators, if they are taken out of the ecosystem, is going to affect everything. Remember, the ecosystem works like a chain. If you take one piece of the chain, the whole system collapses. If you take these predators out, this is what is going to happen. The balance between the browsers, animals that it leaves, and the grazers, animals that it grass, is not going to be there. And now, that is going to affect the vegetation. For the grasses to come back, to stimulate itself to come back, something has to eat this grass. And the, the grazers must then eat the grass. But if we take off this, and then these kind of predators are not there, and you find the grazers. These grazers are going to graze everything, and they're going to give the grasses too much pressure. And the grasses, when they're under pressure, instead of standing, they are going to grow as they're lying. Now, when it comes to the browsers, it means the trees as well, they are going to be affected, because these animals are going to pressurize all this vegetation. So the predators, they are part of the keynote species. They are there in order to regulate the animals that are grazing and browsing. So these animals, every time when they're catching animals, they don't really know that they are contributing towards the whole ecosystem. Yes, to them, Taking down an animal is about a diet, but at the end, it has got a double duty. It is a diet and is minimizing the animals. Every year in all these game reserves, there is something that is conducted, which is called VEC. It's a failed condition uh, assessment in order to check the balance between the animals as well as the vegetation. Once that is done, then it determines the carrying capacity of the game reserve. Carrying capacity, I'm referring to the amount of grazers, amount of browsers versus the type of vegetation we have got. So now while I'm still waiting to see if there will be any developments with regards to uh, Kuchawa, let's go back to Hosanna who is now having the, the meal. I cannot say it's the last meal because tomorrow morning we might still see the remains. <laughs> yes, hopefully it's definitely not his last. Anyway, there he is sitting in his tree and there's a hyena standing just below him. There we are. Nasty thing. I can try and brighten it up a bit there for you, Dov. There we go. Now, we have a very <laughs> fancy infrared light. That is not a fake light. That is <laughs> at least a, a spotlight. That is an infrared torch. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's very cool. So he's got absolutely no idea that he's being spotted with an infrared light there. Now there's a... <laughs> there. You can see that's the... That's a normal light on him to the right. That's not us. And then there's the infrared light shining <laughs> to the left. How cool is that? There we go. Get up into the tree. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. 
this thing is not going to last long. I suspect it will leave. I mean, Hosanna. I don't think the dike is going to leave. I think Hosanna is going to leave by the end of the evening. He might be even be in time for a catch a late movie. It really is a rather morose picture of the dike, isn't it? It doesn't look very happy. I imagine it isn't. I often think to myself, you know, when we think about death in human societies, we're often, you know, catapulted into a whirlwind of desperately sad emotion. And yet we watch it out here. In fact, many people almost seek to see it out here. And I guess it's because they're not human beings that we don't feel quite so bereft. But when you do look into the eyes of a dead animal like that, it certainly has an effect on me. Maybe it doesn't on some of the tougher of you. But it certainly makes me feel a little bit sad. We may have to pull out of here no, before the end of the drive. We should manage just four minute, more minutes. There is somebody else who wants to come and have a look. And that's absolutely fine. So we'll stay here because apparently Guchava is still fast asleep. Hmm. Nice bit of leg there. He likes a bit of leg. Especially dike a leg. Hmm. Isn't that wonderful that look or the length of the whiskers? You can see them beautifully in the infrared light. You can also hear some cameras firing off at high speed. And I'm sure or I believe many of you are very happy that he's having another good meal. Well, yes, it's excellent that he's having another good meal. He did go a few days without seeming to eat anything very substantial. And he managed to kill his nyala, which he ate most of before his father stole it. And he managed to steal Tandi's impala from her. She had in turn stole it from a wild dog. Then he ate his squirrel. No, he ate the squirrel before he stole Tunny's Impala. And now he's eating a diker, which we think he caught for himself. Now, do we have two minutes left, everybody, of Hosanna? If you'd like to get in your final comments, questions, insults, uh, I would fire them away now. I'm just going to call this other guy on the radio. Quickly, one second, where is my radio? Torch would come in. I'll be out of the sighting in exactly 60 seconds. Alrighty, so they're going to come in. We have 90 seconds left. And we'll pull out then. Hyena's still at the base of the tree. Lurking about. And apparently many of you enjoying the action that we had. Well, it brought quite something. And certainly those hyenas uh, have provided an astonishing sort of story. Sorry, I'm turning the wrong way. An astonishing story for us there with the North Clan. And what a sad one, I suppose, today. But uh, really, Jamie's done an unbelievable job of unfolding the mysteries and uh, well, great dramas of the North Clan of Hyena. Right, that's going to be it from us today. We will, of course, see you again tomorrow at 05.30. I keep forgetting, 05.30. It'll still be dark here. It'll be light in the morrow. We will be light live from the Mara and from here, of course. And as always, your questions and comments are hugely appreciated. And I'm very grateful 
for your continued participation in our live safaris. So thank you very much for that. Stay safe and happy wherever you happen to be in the world. We will see you tomorrow at dawn. Bye-bye.